Um, so I'll go ahead and get started, and it's fine that people are still um, getting nourishment because that's important, self-care. Adrienne Marie Brown, she had already been, um, you know, uh, I've ar I had already been a fan of hers, but at the re recent American Studies Association in Honolulu, I tell you, I am a disciple. <laughs> I became a disciple of her, uh, and I would highly recommend her book, Pleasure Activism, which was a book I didn't know. I mean, of course, we know Emergent Strategies and, and Octavius Brood, but I hadn't been introduced to that book. And, and so, uh, again, Bible, biblical. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I was asked to talk about racial ecologies, which I co-edited with Leilani Nishimi. And uh, my chapter, which I was actually really glad that you asked me to talk about my chapter, so I'm going to focus on the Racial Ecologies um, collection and collective. Uh, I'm, this PowerPoint has slides from that Leilani put together. Um, so it's really a joint um, PowerPoint. I want to acknowledge that because I, I think that collectivity is, I, I shouldn't say I think, collectivity is very important to me. It's crucial. Um, we never work and think alone. We're always working um, together, thinking together. So that, that's part of the, that's one of the um, main ideas behind racial ecologies. I also want to say before I start that, um, Shelley, I want to thank you for everything. Everything. <laughs> I, I know you don't like to be acknowledged in, in, in that way, in the center of attention, but um, so many of us here know how much you have transformed our lives, our intellectual lives, our political lives. I came here to be a 19th century Americanist as a PhD student, and I still am a 19th century Americanist like Shelley, but I didn't know who I was intellectually when I came here as a PhD student. I didn't have a master's degree like many of the other students. I was, I'm from LA, right around the corner here. I grew up not first generation, you know, student, college student at UC Santa Cruz, and I, I truly didn't know who I was. But when I came to this particular speculative community, that's when I really began to uh, uh, embrace the lessons you had taught me as a graduate student. So I want to acknowledge that. I mean, I sort of found my peaks now. Um, <laughs> Okay, and, with, and of course with the racial ecologies. Uh, and I just uh, highlight the word possibilities. The panel this morning was, was outstanding because I love it the way we're, and you'll see in this PowerPoint that I put together before, so an echo of what we heard this morning, which is super fantastic, right? That even when we're not together, we're thinking together. I love that so much. So um, this is, uh, there, and there, some of these slides are from Leilani. When Leilani and I did a book event uh, in Napa, California, um, in the summer, and some of them are from my classes that I've been teaching. This one is from a class, um, and it's from some of the things that I've been thinking about: um, black existential crisis, a belief in living. I want to say that this work is affirmative. It's about affirmation. It's about affirming life, right, um, against this death cult that we that you heard about and that we've been talking about today. Um, so with that, this is a poem that I often, I'm not going to read the whole poem, but I do want to encourage you to read it. It's a poem for from um, written by Asada Shakur, uh, Black Panther, still in exile um, in Cuba. And this is one of my favorite poems to um, sort of set the stage and the grounding, if you will, for life and for living. And um, I just, I'll read the last two stanzas. I believe in living, I believe in birth, I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that a lost ship steered by tired seasick sailors can still be guided home to port. And that's what I think of when I think of our ecological relations. Um, and I also think of something that is really important to me and that I've been saying and repeating a lot lately, and that is that love is the revolution. Love is the revolution. Empathy, hyper-empathy, what Octavia Butler uses in Parable of the Sower as a metaphor for relations, right? 
So that that is again what we were thinking of with um, Octavia Butler. And and I didn't read that part in the poem, but in Asada Shakur's poem, she references Beta Days and Gamma People. And so there's an Afrofuturism even in that 60s poem, 1960s poem. She's thinking, um, she's thinking about the future, right? Um, and I reworld making, which is um, again Adrian Marie Brown and has already been stated today so beautifully. Um, but I also want to mention what I was thinking of with the panel earlier is Octavia Butler's short story, Speech Sounds, which is something I've been working on a lot and thinking about how do we articulate, right? When we, when we are rendered inarticulate or when our, when our desire for freedom, for living, is somehow subjugated to this other death cult machine, right? Capitalist machine. Um, and imagination, which I put in, in the black type just to say we are trying to reimagine our lives um, and reimagine them through, in my opinion, of radical believing and connectedness, um, which is not my, my phrase, by the way. It comes from uh, Jack a., M. Jack a. Alexander, which I talked about in that chapter. And this is just, um, someone mentioned in, your, in the poster for this conference, I don't know, in some of the materials for this conference, someone mentioned this climate change march. It was mentioned. And I thought, ooh, that's right. That's, I, you know, and I have that in a slide from a um, presentation I gave on community. So I just thought, again, that correspondence, like that subconscious correspondence is just lovely. So, and there is um, M. Jack A. Alexander. The work that I'm doing now is about radical connectedness. Um, and the crisis, what I say is the crisis whiteness. Um, so that's why that picture, that's a picture about segregation in the corner. And then I have uh, Jack A. Uh, Alexander's uh, idea of rosinblage, um, collective reflexivity. So that's, that's some, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing about reassembly and reimagination, which she talks about um, a lot. Uh, in her work, but I don't, um, I'm not going to read that, but I do want to say that was part of the thinking in the last, the final chapter in Racial Ecologies. Um, this is the other thing that I want to mention. This is the latest cover of Harper's Magazine, which I found to be um, quite striking. Um, and the, the rhetorical question, the very powerful. Um, and so I took that as a way to think about my um, participation today in the Speculative Futures Collective. Um, I don't know how many people were in at, at the 2010 um, American Studies Association conference where Ruth Gilmore gave her really brilliant talk and she, she framed it, she titled it, What is to be done? And then I, I wanted to sort of in conversation with that, say that when racial ecologies, we ask actually, what are our relations? And um, before I go on here, I just want to mention the origins of racial ecologies came when I was the chair of the working group for uh, cultural, the Cultural Studies Association. They had a cinema and media working group. They had a lot of different working groups. And I was chair of the cinema and media working group. And that particular year, which was in 2014 is when they started talking about it, but the conference was in 2015. They said they titled the conference that year, Ecologies. And so I asked my working group to think about ecologies. How are we gonna present some panels, put together some panels for this call? And I talked about you know race and gender and, and then, there was silence. No one could fathom how they would put together race, a discussion of race, exactly, <laughs> and ecology. They, and so the, no one, they were, the, they were baffled. They were, they were, right? And, and I thought, are you, are you serious? <laughs> that can't be right. So that's actually when I contacted Leilani and we put together a panel. We said, there, there are so many ways, as Julie just expressed, that we can think about racialization, right, and ecology. 
And no, no none of the other um, presentations that I went witnessed dealt with that except ours. So then I contacted Leilani in the summer of 2015 after the conference and said, "We this is a book. And she said, yes, it is. And that was that, that that's the origin really of um, racial ecologies. And it really had to do with what are our relations that were so well articulated by Julie. Um, so I won't I won't repeat um, what she said so eloquently. But I will say for me, Butler asked, and I echo here today and in the work that I'm thinking of now, um, looking at thinking about that Harper's magazine cover. Um, where do we go? Where, where do we go? Um, space, but also relations. Right? Spatially, but also relations. Uh, one of my students this week, I asked that question, and they said, to the stars, because they were thinking Octavia Butler, they were thinking Parable of the Sower. When I asked that question, it was, Really a, sort of a rhetorical question, but they took it seriously and they said, Octavia Butler said we should go to the stars. And I said, I had to sort of temper that a little bit by saying, well, wait a minute, well, what, what else happens in the novel? Where else do they go in the novel? Where else do they go sort of thinking about it, not literally, <laughs> right? Yes and no, right? Because the, going to the stars, Yes, that, uh, spoiler alert, in Parable of Talents, that's exactly what happens. But, but also, I think Octavia Butler means it to be broader than that, broader than this, literally getting in a spaceship and leaving the planet. Um, so um, I'm not going to, I'm going to skip this. I, I am going to talk about Afro-Eco-Poetics, because that's the work that I'm doing now. I'm trying to think about, that's a term that I put together. Other people have used the term in different ways. Uh, Camille Dungy comes to mind. I love Camille Dungy's work. And if you haven't seen it, haven't looked at it, she has the collection of Afro-Eco poetry. Um, and it, it's, um, her work is very is stunning. To, it, just like Adrienne Marie Brown, she is thinking about reworlding um, and reworlding through poetics. So I just want to remind people of this since um, the recent passing of Toni Morrison, I, this is a passage that I think about a lot when I think about eco-poetics and particularly Afro-eco-poetics. And this, um, of course, is Baby Suggs in the clearing. And if, again, remember that Baby Suggs could not deliver this sermon, this affirmation in closed, right? She's out in nature delivering this, um, this, edict, if you will, this, this idea that um, one needs to love themselves. Love is the revolution. Um, so I, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I'm going to just have you look at it for a minute and look at how often um, the word love is used here, and but how it's not just self-love, right? It's communal love. It's collective love. It's connectedness love through connectedness, right? You, there can be no love. There can be no solution without connectedness. That's what we're missing, right? We're, we're, we're this idea that my group of people is more important than your group of people. My survival, our survival as a particular group of people is more important than your survival. Right? That's what we're dealing with. And again, racial ecologies is trying to push against that death cult. Um, so you all know who that is, Lucille Clifton. And uh, here is the entire poem. So that last chapter that I wrote on Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, what I call Womanist Parables, and um, the Book of Eli, which I presented in this very room before that as I was working on that in the Octavia, first Octavia Butler conference that um, uh, Shelly and Ayana put together, which was wonderful. Um, but I don't, I, I want to, this I will read because I just have an excerpt. You have to pay a lot of money to grow poetry. I didn't know that, Shelly. <laughs> I actually didn't know that. 
Uh, and pay for the use of those Octavia Butler pictures. You have to pay money to do that. So I was only able to excerpt just a little bit from this poem in that chapter. But I think that the whole chapter is um, worth reciting. They thought the field was wasting. And so they gathered the maker rocks and stones and piled them into a barn. They say that the rocks were shaped, some of them scratched with triangles and other forms. They must have been trying to invent some new language, they say. The rocks went to build that wall, there guarding the manor, and some few were used for the state house. Crops refused to grow. I say the stones marked an old time, and it was called eternity and pointed toward the river. I say that after that collection, no pillow in the big house dreamed. I say that somewhere under, here molders one called Alice, whose great grandson sold now to, and re am I reading that right? Old now, excuse me, to, and refuses to talk about slavery. I say that at the master's table, and this is what I did um, reference, only one plate is set for supper. I say no seed can flourish on this ground once planted, then forsaken. Wild berries warm a field of bones. Bloom how you must, I say. And what I love about this poem is the last line that runs together. You're not sure how to read it. Is it bloom, you must say? It's just really confused about what Clifton is doing. I used to take long walks with Lucille Clifton when I was an undergraduate at, at UC Santa Cruz. She was there. And uh, we would take long walks because she saw me as, the, as what I was, the little brown child who was completely out of her element. And so she took me in and we would walk and she would talk about equity, but not, she didn't use the word equity, but she said, how is it that you expect the people to thrive when they have been completely, she used the metaphor of a, of a race. And she said, here's the race and you're held back in the race. You're told to just stay here at the start line. And then the other person's gone, on, won, won the race many times over and you're still there, and then you get blamed for not participating in the race or not winning the race. That this is her, her words, her metaphor for what she saw as um, the problem of uh, racism. So I, I only have a minute left, but I'm gonna just say a couple of things. This is another slide that I like to use uh, where Nina Simone, when she got to play in Carnegie Hall, said, I'm, yes, I'm playing in Carnegie Hall, but I'm not going to be playing Bach. Um, and I think we should be. I love Bach. I have a 22-year-old who's a, who's a composer, actually, and does new music, which is classical music, but today. Um, so I, I appreciate that. But we also have to appreciate reworlding and what reworlding actually means and actually looks like. And that, that really is the project of racial ecology, is drawing attention to that. So a couple more slides and then I'll be done, I promise. Back to Morrison, a quote from her Dancing Mind essay. The piece, oh, I keep saying that. Um, the piece I am thinking of is the dance of an open mind when it engages another equally open one, always. And then this is, I'm glad that this flipped back. That was a good flipping. <laughs> this is the last slide I'll leave you with because this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite quotes. As a black woman, and I love, I love the fiction we heard today. As a black woman, I feel an urgent need to find radical solutions. Racial ecology is that urgent need to find radical solutions. Thank you.